All right, so uh, Sue Harding's gonna go first. So this is the first case that I kind of threw out there. Here's the case I'd like you all to have in mind as you're de deciding sliding hip screw versus kneel. Thanks, Sue. Okay, so I've been assigned to discuss the top, I have five minutes, so I'm going to give you the top five reasons why the sliding hip screw should be your first choice in fixing this fracture that you see before you. And I would add most other intertrochanteric fractures as well. First of all, number one, it's an appropriate implant for the job at hand. Uh, this particular fracture does not have a reverse obliquity pattern. It does not have subtrochanteric involvement. It does not have compromise of its lateral wall. Those are the three danger signs that perhaps would lead you to choose an intermedullary device. Uh, that would, and those particular fracture patterns all fall into the OTA 31A3 subset. So we all agree that, or many of us agree, that uh, A1s should be treated with a DHS or a sliding hip screw. The question is these A2s, which fall into the middle of the road pattern, and I would offer up that they do have successful outcomes uh, with a conventional sliding hip screw device. When you see the A3 patterns, that's a completely different ball game, and you can see here the complexity of the fracture patterns and the poor results that are achieved with a conventional DHS. Now, if you do choose the sliding hip screw for the pattern that we were originally presented with, you can expect your outcomes will be as good, if not better, than with the intramedullary device. Multiple pieces of literature and meta-analyses have shown that there is no statistically significant difference in operative time, blood loss and transfusion, length of hospital stay, wound complications, mortality, and reoperation. Um, several strong meta-analyses have, have indicated that, and they somewhat remove some of the bias that goes along with individual surgeons having more experience with one type of implant or another, um, and with the change in the um, specifics or the details of the intermedullary device as second and third generations um, designs have come out. Um, you ha see here two particular um, references, Parker and Jones, which again show no statistical differences in so many of the parameters that we look at for what is a good result. And specifically with the Jones article, uh, no statistically significant difference in cutout rate, while total failure and reoperation rate were actually greater with intermedullary nail fixation. The problem is that intermedullary nail fixation, even though many of you in the audience are very familiar with that because you've grown up in a different generation, is a technically challenging uh, uh, procedure for a lot of other surgeons, in, um, perhaps uh, in practice for a longer period of time. One thing that most, I think most surgeons may not completely recognize, including younger f um, physicians, is that the sliding hip screw allows, um, gives you assistance in achieving a better neck shaft angle, a more valgus hip. So many of you have been in a situation where you've put a hip screw in place, and as you can see on the picture there, um, let's see, do we have a, is there a, a pointer? It's up there? Oh, okay. oh, yeah, I see it. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so as you can see on the picture here, you get to this step in the game where you're ready to put your plate down, and most of the time the plate is not parallel to the bone like this. It's kind of in here, and it's sticking out at more of an angle like that, right? Um, and so people put a clamp on there, and they say, oh, I've achieved, uh, I've brought the plate down to the bone, but what have you really done? You've brought the hip into more valgus, okay? And as a result, you get a better neck shaft angle out of a um, plate reduction. And so I would propose that there's a lot of fractures out there that are fixed with intermedullary devices that are actually in some small degree of varus malalignment. Uh, you also have less intraoperative radiation exposure with the d conventional um, hip screw. And in my experience, I have seen multiple different types of interoperative technical errors that have led to displacement of non-displaced fractures, iatrogenic trochanteric fractures, uh, complete air ball missing the proximal segment altogether and just kind of grabbing at the neck and head with your um, 
helical blade or screw device while the rod itself or the nail itself is not even in that segment. And theoretically, post, post-operative stress risers that can contribute to thigh pain and peri-implant fracture and short nails. Now, newer designs have limited that, but it's still a concern. You will also save America money. The current list price for the sliding hip screw is approximately $1,500 less than that of the long gammon nail, and it shows similar outcomes of less expense. And I did an informal polling of our reps in the area, and they confirmed that in this region, for, almost, for all five of the companies that I called, their sliding hip screw is approximately two to three times cheaper than their intermedullary device. Finally, number five, you and your residents should know how to do a sliding hip screw. It is a gold standard device, and it's an excellent option for 31A1 fracture patterns. A good fracture care surgeon should have a whole bunch of tricks in their very deep bag of opportunity. And the more implants you know how to use well and correctly, the better fracture care you'll provide. The pendulum is swimming, swinging back. Sexy technology does not replace good surgical technique. Never forget that. The sliding hip screw offers at least comparable, if not better, operative results and patient outcomes when used for the correct fracture indications as we have here and at significantly lower costs. So if you're proud to be an American and you're proud to be an orthopedic <laughs> fracture surgeon, you should vote for sliding hip screw. Thank you. Great. All right. Derek is going to tell you why you should vote for the... For the <clears throat> Thank you. That's a hard act to follow. Um, so I don't disagree, actually, with anything that Susan said. If you do surgeries technically correctly, you will probably have a good outcome the majority of the time. So, but I will tell you, done correctly, a nail is never the wrong answer for an intertrochanteric hip fracture. Think about it. So why? Well, you have a shorter lever arm, decreased strain on the implant, decreased bending moment, you have a load sharing device, you can span comminution, right? So it makes sense to use that. What else? Well, there's a mechanical advantage to using a nail if you like this idea, right? You're not dependent on that lateral cor cortex, right? You get this intermediary buttress. Who cares about what's going on laterally? The screw has less excursion. And the nail actually supports that intertrochanteric region, right? So it leads us, if done correctly, technically, to potentially better results. Let's talk about failure rates for a second. So the sliding hip screw, right? In stable intertrochanteric femur fractures, which we could debate on and on about, um, there's a failure rate of, of about 4 to 12.5 percent, depending. And unstable, you get a fair amount of shortening, right? For nails, it's about the same. So the difference here, to take home here, is that for sliding hip screws, there's a difference between stable and unstable intertrochanteric femur fractures. For cephalomedullary devices, there is no difference. It really doesn't matter on the pattern. What about this lateral wall, right? So if you look at our fracture that we talked about, you have to be concerned about the lateral wall. Here's that nice, simple A2 that we talked about, right? So here's our lateral wall. Well, what happens is if you break that lateral wall, you turn this A2 into an A3. Well, then what happens? Well, it fails, right? So how often is that likely to happen? Well, there's a 31% risk of, in A2 fractures, of you getting a lateral wall fracture. If you get a lateral wall fracture, that increases your failure rate up to about almost a quarter percent of the time. What can predict that? Well, you can look at the thickness of your lateral wall. In our patient here, if you look closely, the thickness of that lateral wall is quite thin, so I'd argue that you're setting yourself up for a potential disaster. <clears throat> Susan mentioned this, downside, cost. Sure, currently it's more expensive, but I'll, I'll argue with you that if you guess wrong and you use a wrong implant and it fails, then the cost significantly goes up in the care of that patient if you use that sliding hip screw. So we talk about this. We talk about whether it's stable or unstable to help us determine implants. I say, who cares? Just nail it. Thank you. All right. Um, very efficient. I guess you just figured there's really not much to talk about. That's just the answer. But uh, I, think, uh, I think Dr. Harding gave a, a, an excellent argument as well. Well, I'm, I'm going to be uh, impartial here. So 
go ahead. So you're going to pick uh, one for sliding hip screw, two for nail. Here's this case. So kind of base it off of the minimal information you have here and go ahead and then we'll show the results. How much time do they have? Do you have a clicker? <laughs> you can raise your hand and I can try to add it in and do some math. <laughs> All right, so um, we have a winner. That would be Dr. Donigan. Congratulations. I don't have a prize for you, but they get your vote. Um, all right, well, I'm not going to really make any comments. I mean, I think the results speak for themselves. I wonder what this would have been like five or ten years ago. Well, let's go right into the